Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Tam and I'm the Partner Marketing Manager at ISA Cybersecurity. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Fireside Chat to learn how Peel Regional Police uh, provide powerful web security in a mobile world. Before we begin the discussion, I'd like to just share a few quick housekeeping notes. First, this event is being recorded and the recording will be made available after the event. Second, there will be time for a Q&A at the end, so please put your questions in the Q&A button below. Um, we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions, but if we run out of time, we'll send a follow-up email with answers to the questions we didn't get to. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Tony Ventura, and our moderator, Phil Armstrong. Tony is the Director of Information Technology Services at Peel Regional Police, with expertise in project and data center management, infrastructure support, and digital transformation of processes and services, as well as the creation and execution of strategies to improve security and disaster recovery plans. In the last 16 years, Tony has been integral in the digital transformation and the maturation of the security at Peel Regional Police. More recently, Tony led the digitization and transformation of Peel Regional Police's IT infrastructure to support initiatives such as app-enabled, cloud-delivered, and body-worn cameras that improve the services delivers to over 50 million individuals in the region. And Phil, is our moderator today, is the president and CEO of McCathian Ventures, which is a board advisory and technology investment company. In March 2021, he retired from his position as EVP and global CIO of Great West Life Co., which is Canada's oldest life insurance company. Phil is a seasoned corporate director, uh, strategic advisor, founder, and fintech investor with over 40 years of global financial services experience. In 2020, Phil was inducted into the CIO Hall of Fame as its first and only Canadian-based CIO. InsureTech Magazine also described him as the world's third most influential InsureTech leader. Over to you, Phil. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, welcome, Tony. I think before we get into our uh, discussion today with Tony, uh, what we normally do here on the, our web webcasts uh, is we do a quick poll question. We want to sample the audience, get a little bit of feedback and engagement from the audience. And so perhaps, Michelle, we can move towards a quick poll question. We're going to do three poll questions today. And the first poll question you can see on the screen now, if you'd be so kind as to answer that question, please. Are you still routing internet traffic through your on-prem security appliances? I'll give you a couple of seconds to just click yes or no on this. This will help myself and Tony understand where you are in your transformation, your cyber transformation journey. And do we have the results coming in, Michelle? Yep, I will end the poll now and just pull up the results. Nice, easy one to start the day. Nice, easy question. Well, look at that. 89% yes, 11% no. So Tony, that, that gives us a little bit of an indication on where people are towards maybe a, a zero trust transition or where they are in their cloud transition. Yes, very quickly, just before I, I, I kind of address the, the poll question and, and uh, answer where we're going, I just want one minor point of clarification. So while Peel Police does police 50 million people, I have to be transparent and say 48 million of those people pass through the airport. So only about 2 million people live within the region of Peel. <laughs> we're not the biggest police service in all of Canada because of 50 million people. That's largely because of the traffic at the airport. A population explosion growth in Canada, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so very quickly, the way we started on our cloud journey at Peel Police is we had an inflection point about five years ago. So our on-prem internet filtering um, appliances were due for refresh. And one of the things, one of the capabilities that we didn't have at the time that we knew we needed was SSL inspection. So even way back then, there was an explosion of encrypted traffic and uh, modern web threats are using encrypted uh, traffic to uh, communicate to their command and control servers. So in order for us to have the transparency and visibility that we needed to, to remain secure, we knew that that was a critical piece for us. 
So understanding that that's very CPU intensive and again, varies a lot based on your internet traffic and it's very difficult to uh, buy equipment to the peaks of your traffic. So um, that in conjunction with even five years ago, I mean, I know a lot of people are probably very far ahead on their cloud journey, but we realized even as a public entity, we would be going to the cloud and uh, the cloud is somewhere where probably everybody's going to end up one day or not. So we recognize that it made sense to, um, I'm going to use the words outsource, but basically to uh, have our web, web filter in the cloud for a number of reasons. One, the, the elasticity, two, so that we could do the SSL inspection. And the third thing is, and, and a lot of the people in our space kind of looked at us sideways and saying, as a police service, what are you doing with a SaaS solution um, inspecting your internet traffic? My position was and still is, the traffic that we're inspecting for the most part is publicly available internet traffic, right? It's all stuff that's coming in anyway. So by moving your security appliance from inside your firewall to outside of your firewall, isn't that much a departure because all of the stuff that you're uh, filtering is coming from the internet. It's born in the internet. It's transverse, traversing the internet. So those were the, the three main reasons that uh, we made that, that movement back then. And uh, again, in our space, we were kind of a little bit ahead of the curve where a lot of people, and, and even the poll showed it today, a lot of people are still routing and filtering their own traffic. And uh, again, I'm sure there are difficulties around capacity. One of the things that we also found as well is our old uh, on-prem solutions really delivered a terrible user experience. You would get broken elements on the screen all the time. We were constantly adjusting rules and, uh, and websites and whatnot. And now that we've gone to Zscaler, uh, we have a very, very good user experience. The traffic is always fast, um, very few elements that are, that are broken, very little adjustment that we have to do on an ongoing basis. So I hate to use the expression, but it, it just works. And quickly, Tony, what was the process that you used or uh, followed uh, to find those solutions? Uh, uh, so way back then and five years ago, and even today, I mean, if you look at the Gartner Magic Quadrant, which is a public entity, we, we depend on them to do a lot of our research for us. Uh, but if you look at the Magic Quadrant, uh, Zscaler has been in the top right-hand corner, I think since the beginning of that quadrant, and also been in there all alone the whole time. So that gave us a very high level of confidence that they're certainly market leaders and trailblazers. Uh, in addition to that, we also had a sort of... Um, gradual approach to moving to Zscaler. So one of the very early products that Zscaler had was something called Zscaler Shift. And at that time, we were just standing up internal employee Wi-Fi and we needed uh, uh, the ability to make sure that the traffic was going to be uh, clean because um, we were planning not to control the traffic. It would be a wide open internet, but we just wanted to block known bad. And with that, we needed a solution. Uh, we did look at some other solutions like DNS-based solutions, uh, the filter based on DNS address and, and reputation, but we felt that that wasn't enough. So we actually implemented Zscaler Shift for our, uh, we call it our employee Wi-Fi use case, and we used it for a while to prove it out and, and gain understanding and confidence. Uh, and through that, we realized that it was you know, obviously catching and, and stopping a lot of threats. We also saw fantastic reporting and uh, a lot of flexibility in its, um, uh, in its use. So from there, we slowly graduated onto the enterprise platform and then moved all our on-prem traffic um, to um, through the Zscaler Club. Yeah, perfect. And of course, a big advantage of that would be inspection of encrypted traffic. I've, I've seen that about 90% of malware these days is embedded into encrypted traffic. And I think the stat is only 20% of organizations have the capability of inspecting encrypted traffic in line in real time. Yeah, and that was a very specific differentiator for us because with SSL inspection, not only do you get the um, capability of scanning inside the traffic to make sure that it's not malicious and it, it's not uh, exfiltrating your data, we've also had some ancillary benefits. For example, our current organizational uh, posture is that for our uh, computers and the vehicles, we allow only very limited internet. So we allow access to Canada 411, Canada Post, a few different websites. It's, it's an, in the number of 10 or 12 different websites. But as we evolved as an organization, some of the things that we wanted to present were things on YouTube. So for example, we would put training videos in YouTube or organizational bulletins. So with SSL inspection, it actually allows us to lock down YouTube access to a specific page or specific channel, which is something that without SSL inspection, you can't do. Yeah, perfect. Tony, next question. So in order to boost public safety, uh, the Peel Regional Police have recently adopted cloud-enabled body-worn cameras. Um, 
What cybersecurity challenges and considerations does this digital innovation bring about? So for us as a policing organization, it kind of flipped us inside out. And I'm going to say that that's probably what happened in industry about 10 years ago, where before it was all about the castle and moat. And as long as you had a big uh, fancy perimeter with lots of firewalls, you were safe. Now, by putting this critical pool of data and application outside of our firewall, sorry, excuse me, that um, um, required us to pivot. So we have to do things differently. We have to make sure that now our crown jewels, which now are outside of the, the, our, our premises, are secured. Um, so that was a big shift for us internally. We had for a long time as an IT department been struggling with uh, what does our cloud adoption look like? And um, um, that was partly tied to organizational risk appetite, which, by the way, changed with our change of leadership. So with a new chief and a new executive team, we went from being very cloud averse to very cloud friendly. So we had to pivot on that very quickly. So one of the things that we realized is that because now our, um, some of our crown jewels are on the outside, we need to provide modern uh, access methods. It doesn't make sense to um, um, trombone or hairpin all your traffic back through your data center from a mobile device just so it can go back out to the cloud. And this is something I say, and I, Marco, one of my lead security people is on this call, friends don't let friends hairpin traffic. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible for user experience because now my my um, um, my data is um, all my web traffic is taking some extra hops that aren't really adding any value. Uh, whereas where I'm in a cloud world, I can go from my mobile device straight to the cloud and back again in a secure way without having to take this. In addition to that, given that uh, I know a lot of people on this call are public sector entities and police services. Um, that puts a big strain on our bandwidth. So if all of their internet traffic is coming in through our firewalls to be filtered and then right back out again, um, all the traffic is going in and out twice. So if I'm scanning a video, I'm scanning it in and out again, right? Uh, all that is traversing my, my internet link twice, which then means I have to have a significant investment in bandwidth. And uh, again, it, it's um, um, I'm sure not lost on anyone. Video is very significant in terms of size. So having that all flow through our firewalls and through our, uh, our network connections does impose a, a technical penalty to the rest of the people who are working on-prem uh, because we're all sharing these constrained assets. And I can imagine those firewalls are not cheap. They run software with licensing fees. They need patching. They're going to detach a lot of effort from your cyber team into non-productive type activities. So there's probably a lot of savings there if you redirect that traffic through a zero trust exchange and not through backhauling it into your into your DMZ and your Castle and Moat architecture. 100%. And I think to me, I tend to put user experience ahead of everything. So if something delivers a really great experience to our users and it's administratively burdened on IT, I think that's the role of IT is to take on that administration, that burden on behalf of the users. In this case, uh, it's not just about that. It's about, again, the user experience is paramount. We have to make sure these apps are responsive. Everyone's got a mobile phone. They know what good response should be like. Second to that is it's the, uh, not only about the, the cost savings, but technically complex. So firewall administrators tend to have a very specialized skill set. And the more time we spend on administering firewalls and making sure they're failover and whatnot, that takes us away. There's an opportunity cost from other things that we could use uh, those people forward. So we could drive the business forward. We could do other cloud enabled things and really modernize the business rather than focusing on uh, kind of old and, and state of good repair type stuff. So we really want to drive the business forward. And in order to do that, we have to free up the resources. Again, being a public entity, resources are always a challenge for us. Yeah. And disconnecting those devices that are in the field those mobile OT devices, disconnecting them from directly connecting to the network provides advantages as well. So you're eliminating lateral movement, I would suppose, and the, and the, the normal attack chain that you would see very common with cyber criminals. 100%. And I would add to that, that uh, even though we have redundant data centers and we've got you know failover and DR recoveries, we cannot hope to have the level of DR and, and geographic resiliency um, that cloud providers can provide. There's just no way we can do it. We can't afford to do it. We haven't got the manpower to do it and we haven't got the, uh, the financial resources to do it. So to think that we can have a network as diverse and robust as a cloud security provider is just fallacy. Yeah. So Tony, I'm hearing a lot of comments in the industry around um, with more assets and services being in the cloud instead of in your data center. 
uh, and being spread across different suppliers and consumption models, that really this signals the death of the corporate network, that the network is now moving from behind the safety of the firewalls out into the internet. And of course, with uh, your architecture using Zscaler, you get an opportunity, I would imagine, to hide your corporate network within the internet itself because you can't attack what you can't see. Are you seeing that? So I think there's two things. I'm an 80-20 kind of guy. And I think even as a police service, 80% probably of what we do can go into the cloud. There's probably some things that we really want to hold near and dear to us, things like our computer-rated dispatch and maybe 911 call handling, where we want to make sure that it's on-prem so that if the world goes to pot, we can still operate as a police service. I mean, that's that's what the public demands of us. Um, as far as uh, your comment about um, hiding, and one of the great things that we get from Zscaler is that we get to hide in plain sight. So because all of our traffic ends up going, internet traffic, uh, excuse me, goes from our prem straight to the Zscaler cloud, we get to hide in the obscurity because everything comes through Zscaler. So as an adversary, you don't know if the traffic is coming from Peel Police or a bank or a FinTech or an insurance company. So in that essence, we're kind of hiding in the plain sight in a crowd. That, that obfuscation certainly does help us be a little bit more anonymous. Yeah, perfect. Let's move to the next question, please. So Tony, uh, can you share some key outcomes and success factors for this initiative, this journey that you've been on? Yeah, so as I kind of uh, mentioned, uh, customer experience was one of the, the primary things, if not the primary thing, uh, in making sure that our, uh, our customers have a good user experience on the internet. So at the time when we went with Zscaler, that really meant on-prem connected devices, uh, surfing the internet and, and getting good uh, responsive internet uh, um, experience, right? So that there's no lag in holding the pages. We're not getting broken elements all the time. Um, we're not getting false positives. So that was a very key part of that. Now, as we've evolved in this journey in the last uh, 18 months or so, we've gone completely mobile. So we've deployed 2,500 mobile devices. So now mm -hmm. that's really um, expanded our kind of use case, but also the value. So now all of our devices are connected. When you're on-prem, you're connected through that. Uh, we are moving towards uh, ZCC on all of our endpoints. So we get some additional uh, um, um, security for devices that are off-prem and may not be v VPN connected. We don't have a VPN on demand policy. So you conceivably could take a laptop off-prem, take it home, surf the internet without the protection. So with Zscaler, that, that will close that security hole that we have. Um, and again, from our mobile devices, now all of the internet traffic that they have is being secured um, and filtered. And I also need to mention the fact that it's also logged. So in some cases we, and we don't log for holding people accountable. That's not the reason for it. We mostly hold to uh, demonstrate transparency that we didn't do stuff. More often than not, there's complaints against the police service that said your officer did X and your officer did Y. And now we're in the position where we can demonstrate with transparency, here are the logs and clearly what's being alleged did or did not happen. So I think that's a very important key of it. Um, there is actually from time to time, we do have to hold people accountable because people do things that maybe they shouldn't do and the logs will be there as well. One of the things I'm gonna say that's very interesting for us as a police service uh, is that we block very, very, very little web traffic. We basically only block known bad. So if it's malicious or if it's virus or phishing, that type of thing, because of the nature of the business that we're in, we know our officers have to go to sites that would be considered gray or be blocked at other agencies. Things like uh, websites that promote uh, prostitution and human trafficking, uh, pornography sites, um, buy and sell type sites, uh, even video gaming sites, because there is, you know, communication that's going back and forth over like the Xbox Live network and the PlayStation network. So those are things that in a bank, I might block all the buy and sell type sites, but because of the business that we're in, that's actually part of our business. So we've taken a very um, open approach because we have to, but the counterbalance that the, the countermeasure is we've got good auditing. So if people are spending an inordinate amount of time in on a gambling website, for example, and their job doesn't have anything to do with the gambling, we have those logs and we can demonstrate again the transparency of these people are behaving in an off task kind of way and we can uh, take uh, hold them into account for their actions. Yeah, coming from a financial services background, uh, I, I certainly I d didn't experience that openness. <laughs> 
but I can see the balance there because that's something that you know your your associates are going to have to do on a day to day basis during their job. So you need to balance being open but also being safe. I I totally get that. That's really interesting. Um, and you talked a number of times, probably five or six times now, about increasing the user experience, increasing the user experience. Are you getting that feedback from your users now around a better experience, a better connection experience, you know, less latency, things like that? So one thing that I will say is that I view myself as the number one user. I'm the first person to try out the new technologies because I feel that as the director of IT, I have to live it before I can give it to anybody else. So, and, and we're kind of probably a funny organization where people won't call you and say the internet's really great, or people won't call you and say, um, you know, the things are broken, uh, sorry, that things are, are going well, but they are the first ones to call if your internet is slow or things aren't coming up. So I think it's a, a duality of things. So because I follow all the same security policies and I have all the same filtering as everybody else does, I'm a good, um, I want to say uh, canary to say, my internet experience is good. I don't get latency. I don't get any of this stuff in conjunction with people don't call and complain anymore where they used to. I, when I first joined PO Police, we would get calls daily. The firewall is blocking this. The firewall is blocking that. Obviously, the, not realizing that it's the content filter, which may or may not be part of your firewall. Um, but people say this website doesn't work and that website doesn't work. Now it's really on an exception basis where uh, things don't work. And those are typically websites that are using things like certificate pinning so we can't do SSL inspection like all Apple does that um, so when we're going to Apple websites we have to trust them but really it's it's not a lot and we don't get a lot of complaints about internet we don't get complaints about performance uh, we don't get complaints about anything else and everything just kind of seems to work so I almost want to say the absence of complaints means that our customers are happy because that's just kind of how our culture is yeah no that's good no noise is uh, is a good thing to have Let's move on to the next question, please. <clears throat> so Tony, you've, you've talked a little bit about your journey getting to where you are now and increasing the user experience and also elevating your cybersecurity capabilities and responsiveness. But what, what's the next phase of your cybersecurity roadmap with ISA Cybersecurity and Zscaler in partnership? So we are at the point now where all of our mobile devices will be covered by Zscaler by uh, the end of this month. So like in six days, uh, we're moving towards that. And then now we're moving retroactively to uh, move away from some of the architectural changes that we had. For example, we have a GRE tunnel that goes between here and Zscaler and we're switching that up. We're gonna put the Z app on every device, which again, it gives us the additional benefit of off-prem uh, scanning and whatnot. And then we're proceeding on with some of the newer uh, Zscaler features. For example, we've just acquired a license for ZDX, uh, which is, I, I apologize, I don't know what it stands for, but basically it does application monitoring to let you know when your internet apps are, um, are misbehaving and potentially where. So with ZDX, it can obviously point to congestion on the internet or congestion on a specific site, but it also gives you some level of this visibility into the endpoint. So for example, in if I'm using, um, a video conferencing tool and I'm experiencing some problems, when you go to the logs, it can show Wi-Fi signal was low or um, any of another different localized sort of issues that, that kind of help dig it down. What I have found, and I don't know if other uh, people have found this as well, but uh, most of the people that we have employed, because in, uh, relatively speaking, cloud is much newer than kind of on-prem technology. The default reaction I get from everybody, from the IT people is, well, it's in the internet, we have no control. We don't know why, why it's broken. Okay, fair. I understand there's cloud components. I understand there's data center. There's all kinds of routing and DNS and all this other type of stuff. Plus, when you get to somebody's house, I, I get the questions of, well, maybe their kids are playing Xbox or everybody's doing online <laughs> or you know, they're all doing this. Again, fair. That's true. But how do we cut through that noise and actually get to root cause? Like I, 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 I get calls from the chief going, hey, my um, WebEx experience was terrible today. What's going on? You know, it was okay yesterday. So we then have to drill down and kind of peel back that onion and go, okay, well, what's the difference between yesterday and today? Were you in the same location? Were your kids home from school? Where is, was somebody really watching Netflix? Like kind of where's the congestion point? Because without that kind of information, um, we're, we're trying to solve a riddle that doesn't have any clues. So we need to use things like that to dig clues. In addition to that, we are moving towards a, a zero trust world where uh, again, I mentioned this earlier, friends don't let friends hairpin traffic, and we've been largely a VPN shop, which probably most organizations still are. 
And I think for a number of reasons, it's very well understood. It's uh, your people know how to uh, support and manage it. And it takes away a lot of that stuff because you have that ultimate control. You can see when the packets are coming in through the firewall, you have that kind of layer of visibility. Uh, and I'd also say one of the challenges for us, which may exist for some uh, other agencies, uh, and it's not that we're running legacy apps, but we're running not the most modern app. So we still have some apps to do um, unusual things like unsolicited server to client communication. So server will wake up and automatically decide to push a message to you. So in the modern world, that looks like a, an Apple push notification or a Google push notification. In the pre-cloud world, that's a, the server wakes up and sends some traffic to an IP that's been hard-coded. So some of our apps have to adapt, which is going to drag on us a little bit from our zero trust um, adoption. But the problem is that's one of our, that is our the um, uh, critical app for us. That's our, our, our major app uh, does that. So that's going to hold us back. But that doesn't mean that we're um, um, standing back. We're pushing on our vendors to stop them doing things like that, to adopt to a cloud world to make those evolutions so that we can then make our security evolutions and tighten up security. Um, I think you're going to love ZDX. I think it's uh, Zscaler's digital experience um, product. And as you said, for people that are working from home, calling into the call center and saying, my, my user experience is terrible. Sometimes that's their Wi-Fi strength within the house itself. Sometimes it's their router within the house itself. They don't have enough uh, resources on their on their desktop or their laptop, and it, and it's not a lot that you can do about that except identify it and then remediate it. and And ZDX will help you tremendously with that. It'll show you where the latency and the lag in that end to end connection and performance is, which is uh, really really useful. Cut a lot of time out on troubleshooting. It's going to be great. Pop up on that a little bit. We actually had a very similar problem uh, probably nine or 10 months ago where we were having people experiencing a lot of uh, problems with WebEx, which is our corporate tool. Uh, and then it took us a long time to figure out it was actually one it tied to one specific model of a laptop that we had bought three years ago. It's close to the end of life, had a very anemic underpowered processor. And that's actually what we were causing. So we ended up refreshing those units and taking care of that problem. But it took us a long time to get there. Because the first thing is, oh, it's the internet. Oh, it's unreliable. Oh, it's their internet. It's their Wi-Fi. It's the kids. If we had ZDX at that time, our time to resolution on that would have been much better because it would show when these people are using WebEx, their CPU is, is pegged at 100% for the entire time. Well, that gives us a pretty good indication that it's not the internet. Yeah, yeah. And then the other comment that resonated with me was, and, I, and I'm hearing this from all the conversations that I'm having with, with uh, different technology leaders across different industries globally is we really want to improve the user experience. And so we want to retire those VPN connections. The VPN is a little flaky, it's expensive, and it's actually quite vulnerable. And so lots of companies are trying to find ways to redirect traffic through a central exchange and then retire those VPN technologies and those expensive MPLS contracts that uh, that we still have kicking around as well to uh, increase the cybersecurity and and uh, also the user experience. So I'm glad to hear you're doing that. I think what we'll do now is we'll take a quick break. We'll go to the next poll, uh, poll number two, and we'll ask you if we can pop up the, the poll question. How far along are you on your cloud journey? And we've given you sort of a rough percentage here. Give, give us an estimate around how far you think you are in your organization around your cloud journey and your cloud aspirations. We'll give you a minute just to make an informed choice there. And then Michelle, when that's ready, if you could pop it up for us, please. Yep, yeah, just monitoring the trying to reach about half of the, at least half the participants to answer first. Sure. Okay, um, I will pop up the results now. That's about where I thought it was going to be. Yeah, Tony, what do you think of that? I actually thought it'd be a little bit on the lower end. Uh, it's, it's pretty even between the, the top four there. I thought it would be kind of more in the zero to 20, zero to 40. Uh, I thought it would be a little bit more concentrated there. Just understanding that I think a lot of the audience is government and public sector. So 
Uh, again, the thing that I've always said, and I've been in, in uh, public uh, government space for almost 30 years now, is that we're usually about a decade behind the market. So where the market, I think, is around 60, 80, I expected us to be kind of a little further back. But that's really refreshing to see that there are some thought leaders moving their organizations forward. And there's a lot of press out there around, you know, companies moving to the cloud and being cloud native, born in the cloud companies. But you have to remember, a lot of our organizations have been around for a long time and hybrid is here to stay. Hybrid's not going away anytime soon. So a lot of solutions that we have to come up with have to accommodate hybrid, multi-cloud um, architectures. And I think the, the Paul's bearing that out. It's good to see. And you, you touched on a really key point that I'd like to double down on is that I remember when cloud was kind of a new thing. So going back 10 years ago, a lot of the discussion around was who's going to be your cloud provider? Is it going to be Azure? Is it going to be AWS? Is it going to be you know Google? And you hit right on. It's going to be hybrid, not only hybrid inside and out. It's also going to be hybrid cloud providers for a lot of reasons. Different providers have different uh, value propositions. So for example, uh, AWS might be better on analytics, but uh, things like Azure are more ubiquitous because everyone's using the Microsoft stack. Same as Insight. Some stuff will make sense for you to keep inside forever, and some stuff will make you know, make sense for you to rush and, and put uh, in the cloud. The one thing I would say that was different about our journey is we in IT had been slowly putting things into the cloud. We'd put our mobile device management console in the cloud. We put our antivirus console in the cloud. So really not a lot of data, really a lot of utility tools that, you know, from an IT perspective, we need the utility of the tool. We need there to be mobile device management to manage it, but we don't need to manage the tools, right? Like I shouldn't be having to do the upgrade of the uh, um, uh, device management console. I shouldn't have to. So we started kind of small in that way and low risk because it was uh, uh, tools. The flip side is our first business venture, uh, and I say business focused venture is a really, really big one, right? Going with body cams, high amount of data, high number of users. We deployed it all really quickly. I think in hindsight, I might, if I had my choice, take a bit of a different approach and kind of do some lower lines of business first. But on the flip side, now that I can look back coming out of it, perhaps it was for the best that we went first with something really, really big because it gave us a comfort level. That, hey, hey, if we can do something big, we can do almost anything. So um, you just, that's just some of my, uh, my, um, travel, my learned experience, if you will. Yeah. Next question. Question number five, Michelle. So what we've been talking about and in, within our discussion is sort of that movement to the cloud, migration of the corporate network into the internet, hiding your corporate network in the internet, redirecting traffic from VPNs and, and uh, DMZs and appliances through a zero trust exchange. And so you, you can see here that there's a shift not only in your organization, Tony, but across the industry, really, towards a zero trust architecture and a zero trust model. And so zero trust is becoming a, an exceptionally hot topic in the cybersecurity industry today. You can't pick up a magazine or, or read anything in, in our space without hearing about zero trust. How do you interpret this in the context of your business and your overall active defense cybersecurity strategy? Oh, that's, that's a great question. So um, I think I would approach it almost with a, a policing analogy. So that when an officer rolls up on a scene and he stops and talks to somebody, situational awareness is key, right? So you always approach somebody or someone as, as a potential threat. And then as you gather more information, um, you lower your threat level, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Same thing should apply in cybersecurity. Whenever we're doing something, we should always approach it from the perspective of we don't trust this until we understand it. So that goes for things like internet traffic. That goes for things like authentication. That goes for things like device trust, all these different uh, parts of it. So to that, what I would add is that um, in order for zero trust to work, and again, uh, if there's seasoned IT people on the call, they'll recognize the, the triangle, the people, process, and technology. All of those three things need to come together in order to have a successful zero trust um, um, approach. So zero trust is not something like you can just go to the dealership and buy and all of a sudden tomorrow your zero trust FU implemented. Yes, technology is a big enabler for this, but we also have to have the right uh, people in place that can manage and administer that. And, and to that, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier and in taking your people who have been traditionally working in a data center environment and reskilling them in, it's not even so much as reskilling, but adopting their mindset to, even though they, uh, let me back up for a second. Even though they might be great technology administrators on a non-cloud solution versus a prem um, uh, prem solution, 
you have to think about the architecture differently. You have to think about flows differently. For example, in the old days, we would have everything through a central consolidation point and have single, uh, single pane visibility. Well, in a cloud world, for example, you don't want all your traffic coming back because that's just not good for the customers. It's not good for a number of reasons I've already mentioned that. So it's changing and rescaling those people and adapting their mindsets. And then it's about the process. So you have to make sure that some of the supporting processes are there as well, like onboarding and offboarding. When somebody actually uh, leaves, do we terminate their, um, uh, their access to, to help maintain that whole trust chain through the zero trust? Um, so in the context of our business, because, I mean, when I, I've said this kind of tongue in cheek before, but I think policing is one of the very first mobile businesses that ever was, right? Way back in the day when policing first established, it was people on foot. Then it evolved to horses and bikes and motorcycles and to vehicles to where we are today and now to handheld devices. So we have to imagine that without mobility, police services seek to be, uh, sorry, cease to be effective. So we have to make sure that we provide them the resources they need at roadside in their hand at the time they need it in a secure way so that should a device get lost or compromised, that we can uh, maintain our trust. And again, uh, um, many of the people on the call who work for police service will understand, but it's not uncommon for an officer to be running off after a, a suspect and you know things will fall off their belt like a phone. So we have to make sure that the phone is secure uh, as well as uh, when that phone is found that the officer can pick it up and use it. So identity also ties in a lot into the zero trust in my opinion as well. Yeah, it sounds like um, <clears throat> your organization is, has started and is making really good inroads towards that zero trust architecture. Let's throw it out to, uh, to our audience and do the last quick poll here. And let's ask them uh, how they're doing towards moving towards and working towards a zero trust architecture. So if you had a choice, if you had a, a choice here, would you say your organization is is working towards a ZTA or no? And once we get over the tipping point, Michelle, if you could uh, pop that up for us to have a quick look at. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I'm going to show the poll. Wow, there we go. That's great. A recent global study showed that about 40% uh, of global organizations uh, are actively moving towards zero trust. We're hoping that that rises to 50% by end of year, but um, it's gathering a lot of momentum. So you can see why zero trust is a hot topic and why this architecture is so well suited to organizations that are heavily dependent on uh, mobile users. Yeah, and the one thing is, and I understand people's dependence on, on VPN, it's all we had, it's tried and true. One thing that scares me is the cybersecurity leaders, the lateral movement. As soon as you connect any device outside of here to your network, you're actually exposing your entire network to everything else. And uh, I don't know, I'll speak for, my, uh, for myself as an organization, we have a very flat network. We've started to segment, but obviously that's a, a multi-year thing to put things on different levels of trust and we're classifying our network. But today for, uh, for a lot of our network, if you get onto an endpoint through VPN, you can move laterally quite a lot uh, to probably better than 80% of our nodes or assets are online and can be moved laterally once you have a VPN connection. Yeah, I've, I've got a lot of gray hair and I've seen lots of organizations that have tried to segment their networks um, for uh, containment purposes to stop lateral movement. And what's happened is they've overcomplicated their networks. It's expensive, it becomes brittle, routine maintenance causes outages, and the cyber criminals are pretty good at going through those firewalls anyway, getting into the next segment. And so I think we've come, as an industry, we've come to the realization that having session level segmentation, whether it's an application, a device, content, et cetera, applying policies at that level and, and segmenting the session itself is the best way to go without overcomplicating. And you can do that through zero trust. You don't have to do that within the network itself. So, so taking the, the security away from the network layer is, is, has proven to be very, very constructive indeed. Agree. 
let's go to the next question. So, Tony, we're sort of in the home stretch here, wrapping up. What's the one piece of advice that you'd like to share with your peers on the journey towards zero trust? I think I'm going to break from the question and, and kind of answer a couple <clears> of things <throat> that I'd like a piece of advice that I'd li like to offer people is that one, zero trust is not like a firewall. It's not like you buy, you put it up and now you have a firewall. You can't just buy zero trust. Again, technology is a very big part of this, but you have to make sure that your processes and your people are there uh, in order to properly uh, get the benefit of this. And not just, you know, kind of return on investment, but simplification, increase of cybersecurity, reduction of threat surface, all that type of stuff. Um, the second piece uh, on Zero Trust that I would give you is make sure that your line of business apps don't do crazy things like some of ours do. Unsolicited client to server, server to client communication, excuse me, kind of a no-no. Uh, although I'm going to say that uh, Zscaler now even has uh, a solutions for that. So where we were probably months ago and having these discussions, um, Zscaler now has something called, I believe it's called IP anchoring, where you can specify certain IP addresses can be addressed this way. So even then the technology is responding to legacy systems. So while it is, I'm gonna say not as smooth as if you had a, you know, a modern web app like with you know, Apple push notification or Google push notification services, the vendor community, the ISVs are responding with technology to solve those problems. So I would say, even if you think that you have a solution that maybe can't be addressed by, uh, by a zero trust type product, engage your vendors, have the discussions, because I think it does two things. One, you might be surprised. They might be able to fit your use case. But even if not, you're putting it on the roadmap. And if enough people ask for it, which again, we're in the same sort of space where 18 months ago it didn't exist, now it does. Enough people had asked for this IP anchoring type functionality then now it exists. So uh, very much, it's, 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 I wanna say it's a partnership, right? You, you have to make sure that you've, you've chosen the right product, you have the right people in place and you have the right uh, processes in place, um, but also you have to make sure that you have a very strong vendor relationship to make this thing work. Yeah, perfect. I mean, it, it sounds like you're, you're making some really, really progressive steps to future-proofing your organization and positioning yourself nicely to be adaptive to new technologies coming in all, all within a safe way. Um, let's move it now to uh, move our session now to audience Q&A. So I would sort of ask the audience to, uh, if there's anything that popped up in, in Tony's answers and discussion, uh, to put that into the, uh, into the question box and we'll, uh, we'll ask Tony a few questions. There are a few questions that are in there already, Tony. Maybe I'll just pick off the, the top one for you and we'll start our, our Q&A session. Um, first question coming in is, what's been your experience with adapting IT people and resources to support zero trust and cloud-focused technology approaches? Okay, so I kind of touched on that a little bit and, I'm, and I'll expand on that. So our experience so far has been, I'm going to say, mixed in adopting IT people. So, uh, again, given the context we're from, kind of new into the cloud, most of our people are uh, on-prem kind of bricks and mortar type of administrators, traditional data centers. So what I would say on the plus side of it, they have no trouble adopting to the technology. They will pick up the Zscaler console. They will understand all the stuff. Where I find the struggle specifically is, is the architectural um, shift. And, well, in a cloud world, so I'll give this example. So whether you have a Palo Alto firewall or a checkpoint firewall, all fundamentally, you know, there's rules, it filters, it does X, Y, Z. So the mindset is all the same. So if you pluck out a vendor and put in another vendor, it's still kind of that same mindset. With Zscaler moving all of that functionality from on-prem into the cloud, you have to fundamentally think different. You don't necessarily, cons and I touched on this earlier, you don't necessarily consolidate all the traffic to one thing. You don't necessarily bring all your traffic back to one on-prem device for logging. So again, one of the things that we talked about as an organization, we're actually now using a cloud seam so that again, we can filter uh, uh, logs straight to the cloud without hairpinning things back to on-prem. So these are some of the architectural changes that you have to think about. And I'm gonna say we've, we're still struggling with the people adoption. Again, not from a technology perspective, but we're having trouble shifting their mindset. Uh, I almost, uh, and Marco and I have been having these discussions around, we need to onboard some people who I think are, are I almost going to say cloud natives. That's how they were. They don't have this, you know, uh, data center 1.0 or internet 1.0 mentality. They think in modern terms to help bring those other people along. Those other people are incredibly talented and valuable. We just need to get the thinking to change a little bit. And 
Just because you did something in an on-prem world, you may do something in the off-prem world. And I'm gonna say this with no disrespect to anyone, but a lot of these people are the ones who be like, let's put everything through VPN, let's keep our uh, web filtering on-prem and let's just hairpin all the traffic. Well, okay, I, I get it when you had no other choice, but we're in the cloud world now, we have lots of choice. That should not be our thing in changing that mindset. Yeah, and Tony, when you look inside your IT shop, I've heard this from a number of uh, technology leaders now, there seems to be sort of like almost some misalignment within IT itself uh, that can get in the way of a shift towards zero trust. When you think about the the technical people that you've got in your data center that are uh, config management specialists, that's CSPM in the cloud, and you think about the leakage of data through, you know, um, badly configured um, containers. And then you've got another group that's more identity focused. So they're your identity access management people in the data center or CIEM specialists in the cloud. They seem to almost have competing interests, but yet when you move to zero trust, I think the message that I'm hearing that's coming back from people that are on this journey is actually both are very important, equally important, and both have to exist, coexist, um, with different strategies in a zero trust environment. And so that's been a, a, a way to harmonize and bring together the different people who have different focuses within IT to help you move along a zero trust journey. And zero trust actually can um, plug in solutions and, and really complement those two different thought processes around cyber. No, I, I very much agree. And, um, uh... I'm trying to think of how I can best frame my question, but I think people look at cloud like, or some IT people look at cloud like anything else. Like I'm a data center expert. I'm a server expert. I think they expect that there should be cloud experts. But I think, again, the world is evolving where everyone has to be a cloud expert, right? Because there's going to be some servers in the cloud. There's going to be some databases in the cloud. There's going to be some networking in the cloud. So every, I almost want to say that everyone's job is a cloud job and people aren't necessarily embracing it that way. Yeah. Yeah, FinDev SecOps. <laughs> yes. That's the one I heard yesterday. But no, it's true. The integration between the teams has to be tighter and, uh, and more aligned. And, and, and I think that's an evolution of just the IT function in general, not specific components of IT. So the move to zero trust architecture and a SASE ecosystem sounds complicated. Where do you think most organizations start and where did you start in your sort of transition towards that? So what I would say is uh, moving to zero trust and SASE architecture is a lot like I would use the analogy of, uh, you know, 22 decades ago when everyone was really big about outsourcing IT. And the kind of rule of thumb was you don't outsource what you don't understand. So if you look inside your organizations, there's probably some use cases that are very cookie cutter that probably apply to a lot of broader industries and their problems that have been solved. So if I think of, uh, if you have administrative staff who used to, you know, mostly use the office suite and uh, email, well, that's probably a good low, uh, low risk use case that you could use to get started. I wouldn't start with things that are, you know, crazy complex. Like for us, I wouldn't start with uh, our, our 911 dispatching is not where I would start for a number of different reasons. But also it's the kind of thing that if it goes wrong, um, it's gonna have very serious business impact. So I think it's an incremental approach, much like many of the big changes we've done in IT, that we have to take an in incremental approach and start with the things that are well understood, well known, and at the same time, probably low risk. So if we look at it organizationally, like even as a police service, we have an HR department, we have a finance department, and they use traditionally one or two line of business apps, like it's probably email and kind of an ERP system. Okay, let's tackle those two things first, because those are well known and understood and vendor supported. Um, in, uh, in, uh, again, in a, uh, to, to move to this, you might actually start much easier by saying, if you're the type of organization who's already at Office 365 and you've already got much of that stuff in the cloud, becomes even easier because then it just becomes about providing secure internet access to things that are already internet enabled, right? You're not actually, um, in that case, you're not actually um, supplanting a VPN because you wouldn't, VP well, you shouldn't VPN through your infrastructure just to get back to Office 365. So really what you're doing is uh, enabling the cloud service to, to work in a more effective way. So um, 
again, I would say tackle the things that are well understood and well known. And if you've got cloud apps and you've got a significant, and, and we did see there's a pretty significant um, uh, cloud adoption, that's probably a very great place to start. Yeah, I've done a couple of polls on this question before. And without doubt, the majority of people start with Office 365. And then they go on to their other cloud native apps, whether they're ERP solutions, HR solutions, expense management solutions, things like that, that are already native in the cloud, and then start to um, chip away at their traffic. Um, some companies take a risk profile approach. They look at what is their most riskiest traffic and try and secure that first. But, but I would say overwhelmingly, uh, the answers line up with what you've just said, which is start with cloud native applications. And if you're really changing traffic flow and implementing a zero trust approach, start with Office 365. Good connections, um, automated connections between Zscaler and Office 365. I think Microsoft's voted Zscaler uh, their top partner in this space for the last sort of five, six years and Gartner the last 10, 11 years. So that's, that's a great place to start. You know, a few years ago, everyone talked about micro segmentation of the network design. We talked a little bit about this and this proved to be way too complicated. I think I mentioned that as a good question coming in here. Um, what approach has replaced network micro segmentation to limit exposure to stolen credentials? So if someone steals user IDs, passwords, can you talk us through your thinking around what you've done to sort of mitigate that? You were talking about the elimination of lateral movement, et cetera. Yeah, so this is, I'm gonna answer this first as my personal opinion, that stolen credentials are gonna be a problem regardless of what technology you're using. And if you have stolen credentials, um, I don't necessarily know how much lateral movement uh, or how much micro segmentations can help you with lateral movement because you have an authorized user. And if someone is impersonating me uh, with stolen credentials, they'll have everything that I have access to. So first you would have to kind of, again, to me, this boils a lot down to identity. Have we done enough work in validating the identity before we've done it? Do we have 2FA on everything? And that's kind of a really easy answer just to make sure you have two-factor on everything. We're taking the approach here at PO Police that we are going to vary uh, the level of authentication for, for identity based on where you are. So for example, internally on our network, we have USB E tokens with certificate, great. We know you're here, you're on our prem, you're coming from known IP to untrusted devices behind physical security. Well, if you were maybe trying to connect from a untrusted iPad in uh, Argentina, well, we might prompt you for three credentials. We might ask you for, well, obviously we'll, we'll ask for your username. We might do a push notification and then we might do a, another level of authentication. So I think a lot of this has to do with, at, at the end of the day, no technology is gonna save you from stolen credentials. Uh, and again, the big problem from that is once you're on the network, then you can start to move nat laterally. Um, I don't, uh, the, one of the great things about zero trust is once you've got zero trust in place, um, you'll only be, you're kind of already micro segmented. So only the apps that I have access to will I be able to connect to. But again, I think to me, the root cause or the root part of this is how do you um, limit exposure around the stolen credentials? It still comes back to, uh, it's, it has a lot to do with the diligence about how you authenticate and how you actually manage the credentials. Yeah. Um, zero trust within a uh, SASE ecosystem, um, a couple of the futurists are describing this now as the new digital operating system for a company. And when you think about it, it kind of is. Um, most companies are struggling with, you know, I'm going to be hybrid for another decade or so. I've got assets in the data center that for whatever reason, they don't transport well, or they're economically really viable, leaving it in a data center or, or highly secured in the data center. So I'm going to be in that mode for a while. And yet I've got all these digital aspirations and user experience and people coming at me for reductions of operating costs and lowering my run rate costs. Um, is there really another option for large organizations that are in that hybrid environment and decentralized? I, I can't see it. I've, I've talked to lots of people. So is that what's driving this move towards zero trust, do you think? A combination of these factors all coming together in this uh, perfect storm? Yeah, and I'm going to say that as much as VPN was a solution for the last 20 or 30 years, zero trust will be a solution for the next period of time until the adversaries pivot again and once they figure out a way to get around it. And 
Um, no technology is foolproof and the market is going to adapt, adapt and there's going to be an ebb and flow of these types of technologies. Right now, and from where I sit for the foreseeable future, it's, it's about zero trust. It's about only trusting what you absolutely need to, which again, 20 years ago meant, well, we have to trust the entire endpoint to now where, no, no, we can trust individual apps. And then uh, again, from an authentication perspective, um, we'll see how that continues to evolve. I kind of see identity personally as the last frontier and we have to guard that the best because given the way the world is evolving, I mean, again, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it was all about you came to work to a non-internet connected computer at your desk and you would only be able to log in from there. And then we've evolved to remote work and VPN, then cloud technology, all these things continue to evolve. The one common denominator that I can see is the person, the user, the identity. So I think the identity is at the end of the day going to be um, the last hill to die on. And then we have to defend identity more than anything else because once identity can be um, breached, then no technology solution is going to help pre prevent you from um, someone's, if you're impersonating somebody else, you will have legitimate access. So that to me is the, the biggest hill to die on. Perfect. Thank you, Tony. And great, great point to uh, maybe end our discussion today. I'm going to uh, pass it over to Michelle now. And uh, Michelle, would you like to uh, wrap it up with some final remarks? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Tony and Phil, today uh, for joining us and, and for delivering such great information to share with your peers. Um, just before uh, everybody leaves, um, we'd love to hear um, the audience's feedback on this event. Um, we, once you close the browser to this uh, webinar, um, a two-minute survey will pop up in, as you exit. If you complete the survey by January 27th, as a token of our appreciation, you'll receive a $20 gift card to donate specifically to the charity of your choice on charityhelps.org. Um, so the gift card is only valid to use on charityhelps.org. And again, it's to a charity of your choice. Thank you so much and um, have a great day. And thanks, Tony and Phil, again, for joining us today for this uh, great session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tony.